Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about mapping languages in space. But first, we're heading into our anniversary month. November is Lingthusiasm's anniversary month, and it's been six years this year. Wow, the podcast is so big. <laughs> In celebration of our anniversary, we'd like to get you to share a link to your favorite episode or share your enthusiasm for linguistics and for lingthusiasm. Most people still find podcasts through word of mouth, and a lot of them don't yet realize they could be having a fun linguistics chat in their ears every month. Or eyes, all lingthusiasm episodes have transcripts too. They do. We're asking you to help connect us with people who'd be totally into a linguistics podcast if only they knew it existed. This is a bit of an anniversary tradition for us, and we always see it in the stats that all of your recommendations really do help people find the show. So if you want to share Lingthusiasm on social media and tag us so we can see it and like it and so on, if you share in private, we won't know about it, but you can feel a warm glow of satisfaction. And still feel free to tell us about sharing it in private on social media if you want us to see it and thank you and interact. We are also doing a listener survey for the first time. It's your chance to tell us what you're enjoying about Lingthusiasm so far and what else we could be doing in the future. So this is your chance to suggest topics as well as give us other kinds of comments and feedback. Also, we couldn't resist the opportunity to add a few linguistics experiments in there as well, which we'll be sharing the results of after the survey. We might even write up a paper about the survey one day. So we've got ethics board approval from La Trobe University to do the survey. Always fun to have your day job coming in (laughs) with Lingthusiasm. Yeah, it's been nice to bring the two together for this. To do the survey or to read more details about it, go to bit.ly slash lingthusiasm survey 22 or follow the link from our website and social media. Also, our stylish, minimal, reimagined IPA chart is now available as a poster. Thank you to our patrons for funding our stretch goal to fit the design into poster rectangle shape in addition to the square shape on the lens cloths for IPA posters and other Lingthusiasm merch, which makes a great gift. Head to lingthusiasm.com slash merch. Our most recent bonus episode was a chat with Liz McCullough, Lingthusiasm's former production manager. Liz and I chat about how doing science communication relates to linguistics from Liz's other former job at a science museum, as well as non-academic careers related to linguistics more generally. To listen to this episode and all of our other bonus episodes, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. I have a brilliant travel idea that, as far as I know, people aren't doing yet. Okay. So you know how you can go on like architectural tours of places or like historical tours? Mm-hmm. What if you could go on language tours? Oh, sign me up. That sounds great. Right? Like you could just have a local guy like tell you about all the different language things that are going on in a particular area. I would love to take a train from like southern Italy, move through Italy, hearing the dialect change until you get up to the north. And then by the time you're in northern Italy, that's got more happening that's like similar to French. And then you move through French. And then you move through the southern varieties of French, like Occitan. And then that kind of has more in common with languages like Catalan in Spain. And then as you move through Spain, you can move through like Valencian, Manchegan. You could stop for the cheese as well as the dialect. Mm, Good point. Eventually, you'd move through Spain and you get to Portugal and you'd just be slowly moving through slowly changing languages. That would be delightful. Sign me up for that one. Well, as much as I love trains, and I think this sounds like a great idea, I just think you're going to miss so much that way. We need to do like a walking tour, maybe like Hmm. a bike or a horse. So you could really stop at like all the little villages on the way and like find out what was going on. Sounds even better. There was actually this guy, Edmond Edmond, who was a Frenchman, who did a sort of, you could say like biking tour of French dialects. Oh, could he be our tour guide? Uh, sadly, he's dead. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) He was doing this like a hundred years ago. Okay. At the very end of the 19th century, he spent four years biking around France, talking to locals, cataloging their unique words and phrases. And he went to over 600 towns and gathered materials for what would become the Atlas Linguistique de la France, the French Linguistic Atlas, which was one of the first things in this genre of like what's going on in different things. And this is just France, right? Like if we want to do this level of detail around the world, we're going to be doing this for like 100 years. Look, I think it sounds like a worthwhile endeavor. (laughs) You know, just uproot your life. It's fine. (laughs) We would need a lot of local tour guides for sure. 
And we'd also need to understand a lot about things like local history and what has come into making the languages different. Because Edmond Edmond was just keeping track of like unique words and, and phrases, but not trying to figure out why these things were going on. Hmm. Like, I'm curious about why, you know, was there an empire here? Was there a war, an invasion, you know, marriages, nation state building, migration, centralized education, telecommunications? Like there's so much going on that influences what people are making in terms of linguistic decisions in a particular area. Especially in countries where some of those layers have been things like colonization or dispossession of large groups of people, history can be pretty heavy and don't want to underplay that at all. But it is important to understand how these things have influenced the shape of the languages in a given area. Right. And it's something that sort of goes on if you zoom in on any area where humans have been living, there is always something linguistically interesting there. So we sort of picked this very Southern European Mediterranean vacation, but you could do this anywhere and say, what's happened here? What are the histories and the linguistic things that have gone into making what people are doing today? So where are we going next on this tour? Well, somewhere else that's really interesting when it comes to how languages exist along sort of a pathway or a continuum is up in the north in Greenland and sort of the Arctic Circle, uh, northern Canada. Hmm. I've never been there before. This is very exciting. Well, I technically haven't been there either, but I, you know, learned a bit about it in Canadian history class. <laughs> So one of the things that's sort of linguistically famous for the varieties of the Inuit language, which are spoken by the indigenous people up there, is that it's a whole continuum where from one village to the next or from one area to the next, there's all these small differences that add up into if you pick two places that are relatively far apart, people can't necessarily understand each other, whereas any two places that are relatively close together, oh yeah, that's sort of close enough and you can sort of figure your way out through. I know there are like four major dialect groups. So at some point, people must find a way to kind of group these into larger dialects. But on the ground, the situation isn't actually as clear cut, it sounds. So you have sort of four groupings, but you can see how these are related to sort of modern day geopolitical groups as well. Because you have the Alaskan Inupiaq, the Western Canadian Inuktun, Eastern Canadian Inuktun, and Greenlandic Kalathlisut. So you can see how the like Alaskan grouping versus the Greenlandic grouping are to some degree modern day political entities, in addition to all of these groups sort of being cousins of each other as you go along the coast of the Arctic Ocean. And if we were to pack up the sled dogs or maybe get some kayaks and uh, mm. head into that Kalathlisut speaking area, you can see how they are all similar, but there are differences as you move through the chain. So as you move geographically from one side to the other, you have in the West – the word for I is isi, and as you move further east, it becomes ili, and then further along, right up in the north, you get ihi, and you can hear that the consonant in the middle there is changing in its pronunciation as you move through. And it's not just for the word I. So this is I as in the body part, yeah? I as in the body part, E-Y-E. If you speak a variety that has that S there, that's systematic in words that have that. So there's going to be a whole bunch of words that have the S where a little bit further east, they might have the L and further east from that, they might have the H. Yeah. So it's a, a systematic set of changes, which means if you are used to hearing people from a neighboring variety, you might be used to understanding what the systematic changes are. But as you move further along, it might get harder for you to understand what's happening in someone else's variety. Yeah, and this sometimes comes up when it comes to the name of a language. So sometimes people in Canada talk about the Inuit language or the Inuit languages, mm -hmm. depending on whether you're more of a lumper or a splitter. Sometimes people talk about Inuktitut versus Inuktitut, because there's one variety in the northern part of Quebec where they don't say the K before the T in that context. Mm. So you can see it in sort of the name of the language, there's sort of these subtle differences that go across the area. But it still sounds like it's kind of the same word. And so there's been some efforts in like teacher training in Iqaluit, which is the capital of Nunavut, to figure out, okay, how can we sort of train teachers from different communities? And then they can go back and teach their own community's variety to people in that community, which is what they want, but also have the benefit of doing a certain amount of centralized training as well. So it's sort of figuring out how much centrality are you going to do? How much standardization are you going to do? You know, what types of media and resources are people going to encounter in a particular area? Across history, there have definitely been periods where people have found it to their advantage to see themselves as one group or one language with people who speak similar varieties. And there have been points in history where even small differences have been used to declare that these are very different languages spoken by very different groups of people. 
And it's always worth remembering that that is as much a political decision, often more of a political decision than it is a linguistic decision. And it seems like that Inuktitut education program is trying to balance those two competing things. Right. And to go back to France for a sec, like one of the reasons why it feels like, at least if you're, you know, somebody who's learning French as a foreign language, that there is this like one French that people learn is because the Paris based government went to a lot of effort to try to stamp out regional variation in French. Mm. But regional variation is sort of the natural state for languages to exist. The idea that everybody in what's defined as a nation should speak exactly the same way is something that like people in governments decide, <laughs> less so that people who are sort of on the ground who are just want to be able to talk to their neighbors are doing in any area. I guess one of the challenges for our tour is to not get distracted by the fact that geographic variation isn't the only variation we have. In any place, you might expect variation between people of different ages. Mm -hmm. There might be gender-based differences, which I'm sure a good tour guide would point out to us without letting us get too distracted, <laughs> given that geographic variation is our focus on this tour. But it's not the only type of variation we have, for sure. And especially in sort of larger population areas, mm. you know, you may have things that are based on social class or the groups of people, region, districts that people live in, but also like which groups tend to interact with each other more. We could take tours on any scale. We've gone across the north of Canada and across Greenland. But if we're ready to commit to some serious air miles, I would love to take you on a tour of the Banzel language family. Ooh, Banzel. That sounds fun. It's an acronym that stands for British, Australian, New Zealand, and South African Sign Languages. And it's a sign language family that spans the countries that are named in it, as well as a few others. And they're all related to each other. So this seems like it sort of makes sense as part of, you know, the British Commonwealth. They are probably influenced by mm -hmm. schools for the deaf with respect to each other, and then also maybe diverged locally in the particular local context that they were in. And interestingly, despite Canada being a Commonwealth nation, then we used to have uh, what was called maritime sign language, which I don't think is mm -hmm. super prevalent anymore. But in the eastern part of Canada, for a while, there was a part of the Banzel group that was maritime sign language. But these days in Canada, mostly you get ASL, which is technically American Sign Language, and some LSQ, which is Langue des Signes Québécoises. And these are both related to French Sign Language mm. because the first American school for the deaf came into existence right after the American Revolution. <laughs> I don't imagine they wanted some British people turning up and introducing their sign language there somehow. Not particularly, no. <laughs> so they had a few people come over from a school for the deaf in France and, you know, exchange information about sign languages that way, which is why ASL and FSL are more closely related than the, the Banzel group. Hmm. So yeah, again, the distribution of languages telling you a lot about European history, American history, Commonwealth history, and you know, even with documented time depth of around 300 years for this language family, there is a lot of variation, especially in the kind of lexical level, that word level between these different varieties within the family. And that's sort of this very large scale geographic variation depending on, you know, ships and planes to get from from one group to another. There's also some really small scale variation. Okay. For example, the Faroe Islands, which are these pretty tiny islands in the North Atlantic, sort of equidistant between the top of Scotland, Iceland, and the edge of Norway. Right. Right in the middle of the Northern Ocean. At least if you're defining middle based on these three countries. <laughs> and these islands are pretty small, and they speak Faroese there. And it's sort of related to Icelandic. They're both descended from Old Norse. There were, you know, Vikings and so on going around these areas. And even within Faroese, which is a language that's spoken on relatively small number of relatively small islands, there are differences in how people use Faroese, depending on whether you're in the more northern islands, whether you're sort of midway down, partway down, or all the way to the more southern islands. There's like five different vowel changes that happen in a sort of continuum along this band of islands from north to south. And what you see as you move down this long string of islands is that people in the north will have more features in common with people who are further north. And as you move further down, there are more features that change. So by the time you get from the north to the south, there are five or six different sound changes that have taken place across the language. It's going to be more changes that you have to keep track of to try and understand what someone's saying. Whereas your neighbors on the island next to you in the north might just have a little bit of a, an accent difference. Right. So far, these differences have been coming from the fact that the varieties in these regions have a common ancestor, which linguists refer to as a dialect chain or a dialect continuum. But there's also a thing where languages that come from different roots, but are all existing in an overlapping area, 
start picking up features from their neighbors and getting influenced by each other. So some examples of this are in the Indian subcontinent, you have Indic languages like Hindi and Dravidian languages like Tamil influencing each other, picking up features like retroflex sounds from each other. Uh huh. Or in Southeast Asia, there are similar tone systems shared between four different language families, a Sinitic language family, which includes Chinese, Hmong men, Thai Kadai languages, which includes Thai, and Hmong Khmer languages like Vietnamese. Another famous example of this is the Balkans. Again, a bunch of different ancestries and similar linguistic features because people keep talking to their neighbors. So this kind of similarity is referred to as a linguistic area or aerial features. If we want the technical term, it's called a Sprachbund. A German word. A nice German word. And I've always thought of it as meaning, so I think the literal cognates in English would be speech band. And so sort of thinking of a band of different ways of speaking going from, you know, say red to blue with lots of shades of purple in between. Hmm. But this also makes me think of a very <laughs> obscure analogy. Okay. Which is, you know what else kind of goes in regions along an area and is sort of characteristic of a particular region? Hmm. You know, it's not only languages. Sometimes it's food. True. I mean, a food tour is a thing people do already that they could just improve by adding language. Oh, well, language and food tour. Amazing. Mm. Um, <laughs> but you could sort of talk about, you know, maybe there's like a sort of, you know, Mediterranean style of food where you have feta and olives and cucumber and things like this in a in particular area. And it's not necessarily only characteristic of one area. Like a culinary region. Right. So in that case, is the culinary equivalent of a Sprachbund maybe a Schmeckbund? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and I don't think Schmeckwood is going to catch on because it relies on people knowing this, like, not incredibly prevalent linguistics concept. <laughs> but, like, I want it to catch on. Maybe we could make a Sprachbund cake to celebrate our holiday. Ooh, a Sprachbund cake. I believe it is etymologically related as well. I guess they're all related to sort of band and bind. So mm -hmm. where does this word come from? Like, it sounds German to me. It does sound German, and it's definitely German. And as a non-German speaker, you tend to find anglicizations are something like Sprachbund. But it was coined by Nikolai Trubetskoy, who was a Russian. Oh, okay. And in fact, he originally came up with the term in Russian as Yakshkovoy Soyuz, language union. It's the same Soyuz that pops up in the Russian form of the phrase Soviet Union. Oh, of course. Okay. So he used that in a 1923 paper. I think the Soviet Union was formed in like 1922, so unions were clearly on his mm. mind. But then he presented his research in a paper in 1928 in German, and so he had to use the German form, and it's the German version that has stuck. Ah, okay, so this is German Bund, meaning more like federation, like the Bundestag, mm. which is something in German like national politics. Yeah, so he calced it from Russian into German to give this German conference paper, and then the idea really took off in German, and it has stayed German even for English speakers. Fascinating. I guess like language federation doesn't quite have the same ring to it as Sprachbund, and like speech band isn't actually the same thing. Yeah, it's much catchier, and it's sort of nice in a you know we often get our our technical terminology from Latin or Greek to have some terminology showing up in German via a Russian guy. It makes a nice change. <laughs> So Sprachbunds are kind of the natural state for languages to exist in, unless you have like an empire or a, a capital city or some sort of authority saying, no, you mm -hmm. must speak exactly this thing. Cities really weird up language. <laughs> Cities, they're weird. This is sort of the village state of languages. Hmm. But also, if you try to make a map of languages, and this is kind of difficult, you don't just see like, here's a whole bunch of bands. You also see sort of groups and clusters and some places where the number of languages are more dense than other places. Indeed, yeah. One thing that people often note is that some features of the environment seem to be more conducive to there being a lot of languages, maybe spoken by smaller groups of people. We know that a language can happily be sustained with a speaker population of, you know, four or five hundred people, maybe even fewer, if they are in a context where the language can keep being spoken. And uh, a lot of the places that tends to happen are in kind of hilly or mountainous areas or places on like islands. And uh, this is the highlands and islands theory of <laughs> where you get kind of intense linguistic diversity. 
I guess this makes sense because, you know, the water between islands is a bit of a barrier to people getting by. I mean, you have boats, but it's a little bit harder than just sort of walking across a field. And also, you know, mountains, they're pretty hard to climb. Uh, <laughs> you really have to want to go see your neighbors, for sure. Yeah. So if those things make it a little bit harder to, to interact with your neighbors, then your language is more likely to be a bit more distinct from people that are far away from you by a geographic barrier, not just distance. This is definitely the version I was taught when I was a student. A lot of the newer work has focused less on those geographic features and more on the feature of whether the climate can sustain a large number of small groups. Mm. Because if you're not competing aggressively for resources, it allows you all to maintain your small speaker population. And so I think some of the more recent research has looked at that. But again, that's kind of a geographic feature that's influencing just how many languages you might find in an area. So I know you find this with indigenous languages of North America, where there's a lot more density of even unrelated languages on the West Coast in both Canada and the US, because, you know, the climate's very lush and flourishing, and you just need like one valley for your group and you're fine. You don't need to be going out and trading with as many people or, or interacting with people as much. Whereas on the Eastern side, you have sort of larger areas of language groups or related languages. Yeah, and similarly in, you know, West Africa, when you move out of the Sahara area into that more verdant belt, you definitely get a, a much higher density of different languages there. Nice. All lovely places that are worth adding to our tour. <laughs> And this is a thing, like the geography and the sort of physical geography can also sometimes get overridden by historical factors. You know, if there was an empire, if there was a religion going through and saying, you know, here's what people need to speak, we're trying to impose or enforce a particular language, that can be a thing that influences what language people are speaking as much as, okay, we're able to sustain ourselves in this one valley. I've definitely talked before about how we actually find it hard to pin down the number of languages that were spoken in Australia before colonization, because so many of those languages were erased by the process of white people coming in and changing the social landscape. And they had been really long, long sustained multilingualism and people speaking their own languages in their own communities for so long that there were probably many more languages that weren't even made record of. Yeah, the erasing part of history is one reason why counting can be really hard. And also sort of who's doing the counting and what are they mm. trying to figure out? And sometimes, you know, this is sort of, uh, are you a lumper? Or are you a splitter? But also, you know, do you have a nation building agenda that says, oh, we want to assume that everyone in this nation actually speaks the same language. So maybe there are a bunch of different people who can't actually understand each other when they talk, but we're going to say they all speak the same language and just like a bunch of them aren't really doing it very well and they need to speak like the capital. Or are hmm. we going to say, you know, it's true that we can understand this other nation state next door, but we're still going to say that it's a different language from theirs because ours is the one that we speak in our nation state and theirs is the one they speak in their nation state. So there's lots of agendas that come with trying to say, is this a labeled language or is this something that isn't worth labeling? And even with all these factors, people have been very interested in counting and coming up with a definitive number of languages, even though that is a challenging and incredibly slippery number. Yeah. How many languages were you told there were when you were in school? I think we were talking about there being 6,000 languages. That was definitely a number that kind of carried through the early 90s through to the kind of early 2000s. I feel like I was maybe told like 6,500. Hmm. And these days, a lot of people say 7,000 as their kind of rounded off number. And these numbers are sort of suspiciously round <laughs> because it's, oh, 7,031, you know. Hmm. And I think the suspicious roundness is sort of useful to keep in mind because any more precision than that is very artificial because we don't quite know where the boundaries between two things are, or sometimes those boundaries are constructed without reference to people on the ground. Also, thinking about who has done the most work in terms of quantifying the number of languages in the world, a lot of that work has come out of missionaries who are trying to figure out how many languages they should be translating the Bible into for their missionary work. Right, which is a whole agenda that might not actually be sort of in consultation with the people who speak those languages in the first place, like whether they were asked if they wanted a Bible. 
But sort of where does this incentive come from? Like who's funding all of these boats and horses and bicycles and things that are, (laughs) if you want to have a a single unified count, you need a lot of transportation. And sometimes that funding comes from people who want to donate to evangelize their religion. But, you know, even if you have academics counting, which you might think is a little bit less interference, that's still some funding agency, which is probably a national government somewhere, or maybe a nonprofit or, you know, a wealthy person who says, okay, I want you to go do some research. It's still somebody external coming in and trying to help create this external count because the idea of a local count doesn't mesh with trying to count the whole world. And it's definitely more enticing to the academic linguist to say, I am documenting this language and not, I'm documenting a dialect of a language. There's certainly a prestige to the concept of a language that is at play there as well. And also for individuals who are speakers or signers of that language should be able to say, oh, you know, ours has a different name from those people over there because we never got along with them and we want to call ourselves something different. Like, this can be a political decision at multiple levels. And even when you account for how much is known about the world's linguistic diversity, there's still so much that isn't accounted for. Mm. And so much that is being understood and documented and figured out all the time. And that's why The number of languages that are estimated to exist in the world is still going up, even in the face of so many languages where speakers aren't passing them on to their children, they're no longer being spoken, even as the world is losing its stock of languages. We haven't even caught up to know how many languages there are in the first place. And to some degree, even though it's interesting to try to have ever more precision with respect to a number, it's also maybe something that even when things are known, okay, we know that the people in these two villages are different off of the following parameters. That's something you can say. And you can say, okay, mostly people in, in village A can understand people in village B and vice versa, but not entirely. That's something you can determine with investigation and by asking people and by making lists of words and things. But then the downstream question of, okay, so does that mean village A and village B speak different languages, or does that mean they speak dialects of the same language? Often dialect is sort of used to shunt varieties into the like, we don't care about this box. (laughs) So (laughs) that's a political decision too. I always find it really interesting because dialect is a pretty neutral term most of the time in linguistics, but it has all these connotations more generally of being, you know, not the formal language, not the standard language, not the language you should use in schools. And I think for that reason, a lot of linguists now use the word variety as a less loaded term when referring to different varieties rather than different dialects. But we use dialect a lot because it is still relatively neutral as a technical term. Yeah. And sometimes you also get people trying to reclaim it in the other direction by saying, you know, everybody has a dialect and the standard dialect or the prestige dialect is is also mm. just one dialect among many that isn't inherently better. It's just based on the associations people have made. So sometimes you can try to reclaim dialect in the other direction. But I mean, also you get variety used a lot to try to say, look, there can be lots of varieties for lots of different reasons, sometimes geographic and sometimes for other you know, social reasons or other types of groups. And then on the other hand, you have situations like in China, where all of these languages that aren't able to be understood by speakers of the other languages are called dialects to bring them into a a larger nation state project. And again, you see that nation state effect on how we're counting languages. And something that's interesting about looking at languages through maps is that all of these different local dialects are equally old. Hmm. All of the varieties of Faroese are all descended from Old Norse. They all come back to a common ancestor. And sometimes when you're looking at a language through, okay, well, you know, here's the capital city and everything else is just sort of a version of that. There's this sort of weird version of population migration history that comes into your head where you think, okay, well, people must have sort of spread out from the capital Hmm. city and then gradually started talking differently. Yeah. Where really people lived somewhere for various reasons and sort of came to an area for various reasons and started speaking particular ways for various reasons. And there wasn't really ever one time when everyone spoke the same way in a group of people, unless you go through like a very tiny population bottleneck (laughs) where it was a very small group of people and they sort of gradually spread out. But everything is equally old and it all comes back to the same ancestors that they have. And once you begin to understand that complexity of history the fuzzy boundaries that can exist with where you draw the lines on your Sprachbund, you begin to see why it's very hard to map something like language compared to something like, is it a country? What kind of climate does it have? Right. Because for one thing, I mean, languages overlap a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, there's often people who speak multiple languages in a given place. And then how many languages are spoken in a given place 
is this complicated question. And also, there are way more languages than we have colors. Like, we often use colors to display different concepts on a map, and it's really useful when it comes to, like, nation states, because you rarely have, like, 20 nation states all bordering on each other, so you need to use, like, 20 colors. Yeah. You can generally do this with, like, I think it's five colors or so. But this is really hard with languages, because there are not 7,000-ish <laughs> colors that the human eye can distinguish. <laughs> So trying to map this gets really complicated. There are times when language mapping can be interesting. So often on the show, we'll give examples from the World Atlas of Linguistic Structures, which looks at grammatical features that exist in a sample of the world's languages. And every language is reduced to one point on the map, which obviously from everything we've been talking about with our grand tour of continua of language, obviously a point doesn't really cut it and exactly what they're counting as a language varies depending on what they're documenting. But what's really nice about these maps is that you get this big spread of dots. They're in two or three different colors, depending on how many features you're comparing. And so for this show, I've linked to uh, one of my favorite walls maps, which is whether a language has the same word for hand and arm or a different word for hand and arm. Ah, do you think it's related to whether the climate wants you to wear like long sleeved clothing huh. so that you you see this distinction between your hand and your arm? I've never thought about that before, but what is really nice at this kind of zoomed out big picture level is that you can see that there are kind of groups of languages that tend to do the same thing. So across Australia, languages tend to have different words for hand and arm, whereas across the Pacific, languages tend to have the same word for hand and arm. Right. So sometimes these points can, you know, if you're trying to reduce 7,000 or even it, this map is, is like 500 languages, which is still pretty good, pretty, pretty good number. You're trying to reduce 500 data points to something that's visualizable. You can say, okay, well, we put each language as a dot, then we can see, okay, most of the languages in Western Europe distinguish between hand and arm. There's sort of a band of languages in sub-Saharan Africa that don't distinguish between them. You know, most of the languages in South America do distinguish between them. And so you can sort of come up with these very quick evaluations of what the whole area looks like, you know, at the expense of reducing a language to a dot point. Exactly. So there's a trade-off there. And I think the important thing to always remember is what is the trade-off you're making with information? Because it can be really difficult to use the limited vocabulary that we have for maps in displaying the complexity of languages. And there's this really beautiful map called native-land.ca that focuses on the territories of indigenous groups of people across the world. And if you zoom in on North America, you can see this really beautiful texture of overlapping land and names and stories and territories. And sort of the overlapping polygons idea, which is a really interesting way of representing the idea that, you know, multiple people can have been in an area at a given time, and it isn't necessarily like, okay, you know, this part's red, this part's blue, and there's no purple in between. You get these sort of semi-translucent polygons that overlap each other and show that multiple groups of people were in a particular area. It's also kind of hard to read. Hmm. And especially it would be even harder to read if you tried to represent even more languages on it. So this is a really interesting way of approaching this problem of just trying to shade in particular areas is necessarily incomplete by doing these overlapping translucent polygons. But I don't know if any mapping solution can ever display all of this information. And having a sense when you're looking at any other way of mapping things that there's probably more happening with the story is just a really good first start. But I think if we can make one generalization of this, it's that like for all the problems that maps have, flags are like even worse. Mm, yes. Uh, <laughs> just representing a language with a nation state flag is not a very effective way of doing things. <laughs> because, you know, even with all the complexities that come with speech bans of continuums of particular languages, a flag is just going to say like everybody in this nation speaks the same language, which is so far from being the case in, in so many circumstances. So if languages aren't the map and languages are certainly not flags, what are they? Well, I have another analogy that I'd like to try on you. Okay. What if we thought of languages like stars? Right. I'm a bit worried because we already are kind of stretching the enthusiasm travel budget with our <laughs> global language survey, but uh, take us to the stars. <laughs> okay. So... I was thinking about this because I was trying to think about, you know, 7,000, it's kind of a big number, and yet it's also a number that we should be able to get a handle on somehow, because it's within human experience. So what are other things that there are 7,000-ish of? 
So I looked up how many stars are visible with the naked eye from Earth. Okay, and how many is that? Well, if there's no light pollution and you have 20-20 vision, you can see about 5,000 stars per side of the Earth. So 10,000 total. But like a similar order of magnitude that we're talking about here. Right. And when you, you know, lie on your back in a dark, grassy field and you look up at the stars and you think, wow, there are so many of these pinpricks of light and each of these is an entire world. Hmm. And each of these comes with probably planets, probably other things going on there. They seem far away, but there's so much going on with each of these. And each of these languages is an entire world of things going on that's just as central to people who are speaking that language as, you know, the sun is to me speaking my languages. I guess that means that for people who might be in an area that's full of light pollution, who might only see the brightest couple of hundred stars in the sky. I guess that's kind of the equivalent of the fact that for most of our day-to-day life, we might only notice the 200 languages that are on an online translation tool or the 30 languages that are websites available in. Right. Maybe I can only see a couple dozen stars from a city that has lots of other lights competing with it. And these are kind of the sort of big famous languages that are often found in drop-down menus. But then there's lots of other languages when you have the chance to actually see the full set. And the other cool thing about this analogy is, have you seen the new photos of the galaxies that have been coming out? Oh, yeah, from that deep space telescope. Yeah. And they point the telescope at like a dark patch of the sky that we didn't think we could see any stars in. And there were so many galaxies. I love the photos that compare the new images from, say, something taken with Hubble, where a patch of sky in the old images had like a a few stars, and then the new images, you have galaxies behind those. Like, there's even more out there than we possibly thought. Right. And so maybe a Swakbund or a dialect continuum is more like an entire galaxy, where all of these things are sort of related to each other, or like the clouds and the dust and the nebula that give rise to new stars and that interact with each other and birth new stars are sort of like how languages can come in contact with each other and birth new languages or varieties. And the best thing is, we don't even have to wait billions of years for the galaxies to get to us. Like, there are speakers of the world's languages who can share with us their dialect diversity, they can share with us the experience of living in their own linguistic galaxy. And that means we get to learn from each other straight away. And you never know, maybe in one of these galaxies, in one of these stars, in one of these solar systems somewhere, there are other beings that have some way of communicating that we could eventually learn about. And in the meantime, we have lots of science fiction writers to speculate about that. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, including our survey, which you can do, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get snazzy redesigned IPA posters and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com. And my book about internet language is called Because Internet. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. Have you listened to all the Lingthusiasm episodes and you wish there were more? You can get access to an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, plus our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Have you gotten really into linguistics and you wish you could talk to more people about it? Patrons also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans. Plus, all patrons help keep the show ad-free. Recent bonus topics include a discussion of linguistics and science communication, a paper about a rabbit, and a chat about our new IPA design. If you can't afford to pledge, that's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language, especially this month for our anniversary. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our senior producer is Claire Gaughan, our editorial producer is Sarah Dapirella, and our production assistant is Martha Sutsui-Billens. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic. Lingthusiastic.